We have two Bible readings this morning, two for the price of one. Is that a buy one, get one free? The first one is from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and just a few verses there, and then we'll skip over to the New Testament into chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel. But first of all, Deuteronomy chapter 6, from verse 1 through to verse 12. Hear the Word of God. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then, unusually for us, because normally I stick to just one passage and we think about that one passage, but unusually for us, we're going to have a few verses from a New Testament book, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and there in chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that's devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Amen. Now that song that we've just sung is actually very important and we'll come back to it again and again because it picks up the theme that we're going to be thinking about at least on and off over the next couple of months uh, when I'm taking the services because I want to unpack for you Really, what James touched upon last week in the all-age service, if you were here, which is something of the core of Jesus' kingdom teaching. And the first slide in particular refers you to that. Now, you might have been surprised this morning that if I'm going to touch on the core of what Jesus taught, that I started with a reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the book of Deuteronomy. But you need to know 
that Jesus didn't come to abolish and to set aside the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. And I hear Christians in the modern world, in fact, in social media just yesterday, I saw somebody ask the question, should Christians really bother reading the Old Testament? And I'm astonished that anybody who's in the church should have such a dim view of the Old Testament and should be so blind to what it has to offer and not realize that, in fact, all that Jesus did and taught came out of the foundation of what God had established in the Hebrew Scriptures. And so when Jesus said to his first followers, you have to love the Lord your God with your heart and soul, mind and strength, he was basing that on a text that we read this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's called to the Jews the Shema, the Shema. And every morning and every evening, maybe a bit like some of you with the Lord's Prayer as Christian people, the Jews recite the Shema. It's a prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that's found there in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we read this morning. And it goes on to then say, love the Lord your God with your heart and soul and strength. Very interesting, and I promise to come back to this in a few weeks' time, but the Deuteronomy passage misses out what Jesus included in the Gospels of a reference to love the Lord your God with all your mind. So Jesus didn't just say heart and soul and strength, he said mind as well. And over a series of four talks, I want to try and unpack with you what does that mean? Love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But of course, what I want to say to you is that these four characteristics represent the first four commandments that God gave us. Now, some of you are old enough to have learned the Ten Commandments when you were at school. It was one of the things that you had to try and say off by heart at least on a weekly basis, if not even every day. And the first four commandments speak about God. They speak about His uniqueness. They speak about His personhood, His image, how we've not to make graven images. They speak about His holy name and how we've not to blaspheme that name. And they speak about His day, the Sabbath day. And of course, folk refer to the Sunday as the Sabbath, but this isn't the Sabbath. You know that, don't you? This is the Lord's Day, Sunday. The Sabbath is a Saturday. Not only celebrated by the Jews, but at the end of the very first week, when God had created the world, in six days, He rested on the seventh. And the seventh day is a Saturday. The problem is that in all our diaries and in our phones and tablets and all of that, we've gotten into the habit of saying that Monday's the first day of the week, but isn't it? Sunday is the first day of the week. It's a high point, not the scrag end. So we're going to be thinking about love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that's going to take us four different shots, okay? So I'm not going to do all of that today. And then, of course, we get into what you might think Jesus added to that. But in fact, this is reflected in the commandments as well. Love your neighbor, said Jesus. Do you remember he told that parable about the good Samaritan? Now, the Samaritan was one that showed the way to the Jews at that time. And this actually sums up commandments 5 to 10. Because commandment 5 talks about having respect, giving due honor to your parents or your elders, whichever way you interpret that. Commandment 6 is about the sanctity of human life. You shall not kill. Commandment 7 is about honoring marriage. Commandment 8 is about property and about not stealing stuff. Commandment 9 is about people's reputation 
not basically telling all sorts of porkies about them. And commandment 10 is about not being covetous. What does that mean? Not being envious, not craving what other people have. So we're going to spend one week thinking about loving your neighbor. And then Jesus, to complete that phrase, said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we're going to spend one week thinking about what does it mean to love yourself? And that's actually a hugely important thing. Some people do that very well in today's society. They absolutely love themselves. As someone once said, if they were chocolate, they'd eat themselves. But I think that generally speaking in the church, whether it's our Calvinistic background and upbringing, some of us have a bit of a problem with loving ourselves. And so we're going to spend a bit of time on that. And then we're going to finish off the series by thinking about the most challenging thing that Jesus said, which was, love your enemies. We might need to spend more than one week on that. I don't know. We'll see how things go. But anyway, this Sunday, we're thinking about loving the Lord our God from our hearts. But we all know what our hearts are, don't we? Our hearts are these things that beat inside our chests, just slightly to the left of center. Well, that's the physical dimension to it. But when the Jews spoke about the heart, and when Jesus spoke about the heart, he meant something far deeper, far more important, far more important far more profound. And so I want to show you a wee video at this point, which only lasts just two or three minutes. And I'm grateful to the Bible Project uh, because they've made lots of these lovely videos. If you want to Google afterwards the Bible Project, then you'll see some really super helpful videos. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the fourth key word in this prayer, heart, which in Hebrew is sometimes pronounced levav, or more often in a shorter form, lev. Now, different cultures throughout history have had different conceptions of how the human body works, and this is also true of the ancient Israelite writers of the Bible. They knew that the heart was an organ in the chest that sustains life. There's mention of a heart attack in the Bible, Naval, whose heart died inside of him and he became like stone. But the biblical authors talk about the heart in many other ways that might seem strange to modern readers, and that's because these Israelites had no concept of the brain or any word for it. They imagined that all of a human's intellectual activity takes place in the heart. For example, you know with your heart in the Bible. Your heart is where you understand and make connections. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom dwells in the heart. And your heart is what you use to discern between truth and error, like Solomon did when he was king. So the heart is where you think and make sense of the world, and it's where you do more. In the Bible, the heart is where you feel emotions. You feel pain in your heart, like Hannah did when she couldn't have any children. In fact, the phrase, a broken heart, comes from ancient biblical Hebrew. You also experience fear in your heart. Your heart can melt or be distressed. Your heart can even be depressed. But then, on the flip side, your heart is where you experience joy. In Hebrew, to be happy is to be good of heart or to have a heart of joy. So the heart is the generator of physical life. It's also the center of your intellectual and emotional life, and there's more. In biblical Hebrew, the heart is where you make choices motivated by your desires. So David had it in his heart to build a temple for God. Your heart is where your affections are centered. They're called the desires of your heart. And if you really want something and go after it, it's like what Nathan said to David, whatever's in your heart, go and do it. So then, in the Bible, the heart is the center of all parts of human existence, as in the well-known proverb, guard your heart because from it flows your whole life. Now, the prophet Jeremiah believed that the human heart was fundamentally broken. 
He said, the heart of a human is deceitful above all, irreversibly sick. Who can even understand it? He had watched a whole generation turn away from God. They started sacrificing their children as if that were a good thing. So this is why in the imagination of the Hebrew prophets, the only hope for humanity is the total renewal of the human heart. Moses predicted that if Israel was ever going to love their God, their heart would need to be circumcised, which is a very vivid and surprising metaphor about removing evil and stubbornness from the human heart. David, after he committed murder and adultery, pleads with God to create in me a pure heart. The prophet Ezekiel hoped for a day when God would remove the heart of stone and give his people a new heart of soft flesh, which is very similar to Jeremiah's hope that God would write the commands of the Torah on the hearts of his people. And that brings us all the way back to the Shema. Every day, God's people are called to devote to God their whole body and mind, their feelings and their desires, their future and their failures. This is what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So when the Bible speaks about your heart and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, it's not just talking about a physical thing. It's talking about that inner part of each human being that devotes themselves and chooses to devote themselves to God. And that's why it was really important to kind of show you that aspect there. Now we should be going on to the next slide, Craig. But all we're getting is the same thing. Right, okay. So let me kind of unpack just a few things of this Shema and apply it to what should be going on in our hearts as followers of Jesus as Christians. The chapter that went before the chapter we read in Deuteronomy explains again all of the Ten Commandments. But chapter 6 is saying that God is looking for something a good deal deeper than just a simple understanding with the head of rules and regulations. Because if the Christian life, if following Jesus was just about following rules and regulations, then we would all be abject failures. Because every one of us here this morning could raise our hand and say that we get it wrong at various times, not just in our lives, but pretty much every day. So it's a bit more than just something that follows rules and regulations. Something spiritual is going on here. God is looking for something that's deep. He's looking for something that's personal. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's looking for us to look to Him in everything that we are and do. He says that the commandments are to be on our hearts. Now, you remember that Moses received the commandments when he went up to the top of the mountain on tablets of stone. And we have them written down in our Bibles on paper. But what he's saying here is that, in fact, he wants all that we are to be about as followers of Jesus to be on our hearts, not just on tablets of stone or on pieces of paper. And he says, importantly, that we've not just to keep that way of following Jesus to ourselves, but that it's a generational thing. It mentions passing on to our children and grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, all that we believe about Jesus. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols in your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them in the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Passing on to the next generation what we believe is the lifeblood of the church. Somebody took the time to pass on the faith to us. It may have been our parents or grandparents. It may have been a friend. It may have been a workmate. But somebody took the time to do that with us so that we could know the love of God in our lives. And if we don't do that with others, then we're headed for oblivion. 
One of the reasons it's really lovely to be saying this today is because, you know, this afternoon we're going to have a ton of wains out here for B and for GB and for BB. And they are some of the ways in which we try to pass on our belief in Jesus and following Him to the next generation. But you have a role to play in that as well. Where are the youngsters that you meet, that your life intersects? And do you take time to pass on the faith to them? So it's a generational thing. It's also something for which we ought to be thankful. When you eat and are satisfied, Deuteronomy 6 verses 10 to 12 says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What he's saying is, never take for granted what you have. What have you taken for granted this week? I know there are things, absolutely, certainly, that I've taken for granted. What have you taken for granted this week? Perhaps just being conscious of that is about loving the Lord with all your heart as well. It's about recognizing that He gives us so much. At the beginning of October, well, in October we're having a, a number of special services, but the one I've not mentioned as yet is on the first Sunday in October, the 2nd of October, we've got a rededication of our organizations, our Boys Brigade, our Girls Brigade. And it's also our harvest that day. And that service will combine a desire that our children know God in Christ, but also a concern for the needy. And we'll be giving you more information about what you can do to bring some gifts to honor and help people who are in need. Some of you on our social media earlier in the week maybe noticed that I shared something from the Lodging House Mission, which is a charity that we've supported um, over the years here. And their freezers failed just last week, and they lost all of the food that they had to try and help those who are often down and out and in the street. And it was an appeal to people to help them. So if you can do that, that would be great. So loving the Lord your God is something that's spiritual. It's something that's personal. It's something that's to be passed on to the next generation. And it's something for which we ought to be thankful. As we express our love to God, what we're saying is we're really grateful to you, God, for who you are and what you've done for us. And then we come into the New Testament and the passage we read this morning from uh, Mark chapter 7. And the other thing that our love for God should not be, the others are things that we should be, spiritual, personal, generational, thankful, but this is something we should not be as hypocritical. And in the passage in Mark 7, Jesus was very scathing of the Pharisees who seemed on the surface to be together and have everything right, religiously, spiritually, but their hearts, he said, were far from God. Not only did they try to adhere to the Ten Commandments, they heaped 613 laws onto the people. What a burden that must have been. And sometimes we can heap things onto people as well, can't we? We don't ease their load. We increase it. But the things that we say are the things that we do. How hypocritical are we being? No better than the Pharisees when we say that we belong to Jesus, that we follow Jesus, that we love Jesus, that we serve Jesus, that we worship Jesus. And yet then, in the very next breath, we say or do something that makes someone's situation much worse. So we're going to unfold, we're going to unpack this series uh, over the next number of weeks, probably take us a couple of months to go through all of these things that I've mentioned at the start. But we start with the heart, because somebody has said the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And here's a wee thing for you just to check in for homework 
today or this week, as I was walking down to the church building this morning to prepare for the service, I was praying, you know, praying, <laughs> God, help me to be as clear as I can be when I'm, I'm, I'm kind of speaking and uh, all of the rest of it and praying for you folks as, as you were coming. And I was thinking about this whole thing about Jesus saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And it was almost like God said, well, here's a wee thing for you to check, Derek, that will tell you where your heart lies. Look at your bank book. What do you spend your money on? And look at your calendar. What do you invest your time in? So God was saying that to me. How do you spend your money? Do you spend your money serving me or do you spend your money serving yourself? And he was saying, how do you use your time? What does your diary look like? How do you spend your time? How do you invest your time? Is it in kingdom work? Is it in serving other people? Or is it in selfishly doing what you fancy to do? So maybe you'd like to ask yourself those two questions today and in the week that lies ahead. Amen. And so may the power of our good, good Father illuminate our minds with the presence of the eternal Son, Jesus Christ, embolden our voices, and may the gifts of the Holy Spirit shape our actions. The blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore.